Aloha, everyone. Welcome to Sister Power. You know, our episode, we're just going to have a continuation. And our theme for today is some folks just don't get it. So we're going to have plain talk about mental health, self-care, and vaccine with uh, Dr. Teresa Jacobs and Dr. Deborah Mosley Heath. And we're just going to jump right in and, and, and talk about these pertinent uh, information. So Dr. Heath, U.S. could see as many as over 32,000 hospitalizations per day by September 13th, according to the COVID-19 Forest Hub at UMass Amherst, which is used by the CDC. The low end of the forecast is 9,000 per day. So Dr. Heath, take this opportunity to speak to the healthcare workers about mental health care and self-care. Thank you and aloha and thanks for having me back. Um, when we're talking about them going into these uh, hospitals and other places of, that are medical, um, it's very rough for them because a person that is actually a caring person and they're all um, taking care of others constantly because that is really ingrained in a person that is really a, a service worker and they feel like they have to put themselves aside so that they can take care of the others. I just got to push through and power through and do this. And with all the numbers rising, it's important for them still, and I'm going to say this directly to the healthcare workers, it's still very important for you to take care of yourself. I've always told everyone that I work with, if you don't take care of yourself, you cannot take care of anyone else. Um, so you, it's important for you to actually maintain good self-care. And that is actually um, getting that exercise. Still, like it says, um, doing something just for you. Keeping a journal, writing those feelings down and what it means to actually get that stuff out. Don't hold it because when you get home from your long day, it's, you have to let some of that stay there. You want to make sure that when you hit that door or when, you know, get home, that you are actually saying, wait, let me relax. And I need to relate just to myself, to who's in my home. If it's just you, take the time to just sit, let, you know, you may process that day, but then let it go and say, okay, now I'm gonna take care of me. That bubble bath, uh, some type of massage possibly, um, doing some yoga, some mindfulness, just to let that day um, go. Because it's so important for you to do that because you, you'll get burnt out and burnout is real. And we all can get burned out. Even with the healthiest people of saying, I'm going to care for everybody and do all of this you still want to make sure you're taking care of yourself because you will burn out. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Dr. Jacobs, do you want to weigh in on this before we, you know, move on? Absolutely. Thanks again for having me. Uh, it's just such a wonderful pleasure. And I just want to, uh, uh, just as Dr. Heath is saying, it's okay to guard your own personal downtime. There's always going to be somebody that's going to call, well, try to catch you at 6 a.m. or 5.30 before you get up and get out. But if that's your meditation time, your prayer time, I walk two miles every single morning. I tell everyone, no, I'm going to walk. And no, I don't want to walk and talk. I want to, unless I'm talking to the Lord or if I'm praying or meditating, that's my time. It's taking friends and relatives understand that I have some downtime that I I take every single day now. So every morning, that's my downtime. Beware of those that call you 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night, and they're bringing something to you to dump in your lap because they want you to, to hear their problems. You have to guard your own personal downtime. And it's okay to do that because mm -hmm. if you don't, you will burn out. So guard your downtime. 
it's yours and it, whatever it is that you do pray meditate yoga whatever it is do it routinely on a regular basis all right healthcare workers <laughs> do you and take care of yourself we need you you're our heroes right now uh, you know for quite some time you know my girlfriend i, I was telling you earlier is an er physician and and uh, she came out of retirement and she sent me this text that said face masks don't always work well neither do parachutes but if i ever jump out of a plane i still want one there it is and that's the truth i want i want my face mouth and i want my parachute but dr jacobs um breakthrough covid infections show the unvaccinated are now putting the vaccinated at risk when can i get a covid vaccine booster yeah, so right now the FDA and CDC have decided that it's those that are what we call immunodepressed or compromised. So those are those folks that have had organ transplants and are on immunosuppressive therapy in the midst of that transition. Those folks that are on uh, chemo, active chemotherapy right now. Those folks that are steroid dependent and they're on steroids or high dose steroids. So those are the folks who's immune systems are depressed, which makes them unfortunately uh, more apt uh, to get infected with COVID. And the goal is here, not that they get infected with COVID, but we don't want them to have the moderate to severe disease where they're actually hospitalized. So right now, Immunocompromised folks, we're encouraging you if you've had Pfizer or Moderna, uh, 28 days after that second dose, you can now get a booster shot at this time. Everyone else, September 20th is your go day. Wow, that's soon. And that's yes. good news for us who believe in science. And, you know, Dr. Heath, I, I really feel the, for the parents who have to who are sending their children back to school should kids in school wear masks even if vaccinated my belief is that everyone should mask up everyone um when they're going back to school they're going to have already have some anxieties and concerns about going back in to school um because they've been home uh, many of them, I won't say all of them, because some have actually gone through the whole um, pen, uh, year by going on to school, but most of them have been home and doing some type of homeschooling or home non-schooling uh, <laughs> one way or the other, and they're already going to have these anxieties of, oh, this year I've missed, you know, and, and maybe falling behind and they're not remembering the things that they were taught. Uh, we already see that in the summertime when we have kids off in the summer. So when they come back to school, they've forgotten a lot of what has been going, you know, what they've done that previous school year. And so it's important for us to start talking to our kids before they get back into the school, yeah. before they start. Because if we don't, that anxiety is going to rise because they've already, they know about people that are dying. They know about people that are sick and they have, may have had some people in their own families to, to have the disease. And so it's important for us to start talking to our kids now before they actually get into a school building. Well, if kids get infected with Delta, are they at risk for serious illness, Dr. Jacobs? Yeah, well, the Delta variant, unfortunately, um, is affecting the young and unvaccinated primarily now. So those folks under the age of 40, uh, they are that are unvaccinated. Uh, that we are seeing them in the ICU on vents, uh, two-year-olds. We're seeing 12, 13, 14-year-olds now in the ICUs. So children's hospitals around the nation are starting to fill up with our children. Uh, and our children, many of them are under the age of 12 and they can't protect themselves. And that's our job. I, I don't, I'm not understanding why uh, there are so many in society that don't 
don't want to protect those that can't protect themselves. And uh, those children that under the age of 12, we don't know who's going to be admitted. We don't know who's going to be, you know, intubated and in the ICU. We don't know who's going to die, but we know that if they're exposed to that Delta variant, uh, unfortunately, they're likely to get pretty sick even if they're at home and you have to take care of a sick kid at home, that's difficult. That is very difficult. And it's pretty scary for a kid if they're having some issues about breathing. So that Delta variant is more infectious. And then unfortunately, uh, our children, those and uh, altogether, those under the age of 40 are just that are not vaccinated are the folks that are the new victims now that are in those hospitals now filling up those ERs and the ICUs. Well, when Dr. He speak directly to the parents who are they're they're so you know anxious now, mm -hmm. and and we need to talk to the parents about their mental health and self care. Not only just their mental health and self care, but their their actual anxieties that they have for the kids going back. And children feed off of what their parents are doing. And then it becomes so politicized and they're looking at, okay, which way is my, are my parents going and are my guardian? And I'm, I have to follow what they're doing because they mimic adults. And so when they see this, and we have the, the other effect of teachers and school personnel and others in there also with some concerns, and so they're anxious. So just they're just a big ball of anxiety in there. And we want to make sure that we're we're helping our parents, like I said, to talk to your kids first, talk to the school, talk to the teachers, make sure that you're going to those meetings, the PTOs and PTAs, and talking to them about the concerns and how are they going to actually protect the children. They're the most vulnerable. They're going to walk in and maybe they'll take a mask off, not wearing a mask. And you have to help them understand, maybe even have small groups ahead of time and talk to them in these small groups about how they can even help each other lift up and, and connect with one another. And they see a you know another uh, student that they have pulled their mask down. Even a student should say to them, remember we have to wear a mask, you know, empower them to talk to others about that. And that gives our parents even more power to let them know it's okay for you to take that instruction from someone. It's okay for us to help our neighbors. You know, we always used to say, don't talk to my kids, mm -mm. but we're in a stage right now that we all need to help one another. Yeah, you know, people, if you're just joining in, this is Sister Power, some folks just don't get it. And we're talking about mental health, self-care and vaccines. So Dr. Jacobs, who can ask about your vaccine status? Well, it kind of depends on what state you're in. Uh, uh, you know, there are some states that uh, unfortunately, and it's law that you cannot ban folks from going into different venues or restaurants and even schools uh, if they're not vaccinated or if they're not wearing masks. There are other states in these United States that requires you to have a, a vaccine passport, uh, that you have to have proof of a negative test. You have to have uh, a proof of that vaccine. And so it just really depends on where you are. Uh, now, uh, law though says that employers can require you to be vaccinated. Uh, or you have to have some reasonable reason why you can't if you ha have allergies to it or some medical condition that will allow you to be vaccinated. So employers in the United States can mandate a COVID vaccine as a, for, uh, as a condition of employment. And should they can I, ask. Should I laminate my vaccine card? Should I laminate my card? 
No, they don't want you to do that. Yeah. A lot a lot of folks went out and got them laminated. They prefer for you not to do it because what they like to do is add on the booster shot now because if it's laminated, now uh, it's going to be difficult to write on a laminated card. So they prefer for you not to, but if you did laminate it, then you'll just have to get a new card and they can actually update the card for you, but they prefer for you not to laminate it. Mm, that's good information because I did speak to a few people who said I, you know, because people are, are who really believe in science, they yeah. take this very serious. They take their vaccinations very serious, and I, I applaud them for that. But you heard it here first, people: do not get your your um, cars laminated. Um, so, <laughs> wow, <laughs> Doctor Heath, how to do a mental health check? How do we do a mental health check? Well, what we could do is actually, you can do a self-care check yourself. How am I feeling? Is this interfering with my daily functioning? Am I sleeping too much? Am I eating too much? Am I not eating enough? Am I not sleeping? Those are things and tips that can give you an idea if you're at a state of not well. Um, because that's what mental health is, is a state of well-being. And so if you're in that state of well-being, you're getting enough sleep, you're exercising, you're um, talking it out, you're working through any issues that come up. But if you're not in that well state, it's interfering with your daily functioning. Maybe it's very hard for you to get up in the morning. We may find that a lot with our children, in fact, mm -hmm. as they start to school. It may be that they are not able to get up because they have all those fears and anxieties that they're holding and they're not talking about them. And it's difficult for them to even get up and go to school. It's the same with, with people that have to get up and go to work. It may be very difficult for them to actually go to a work site because everyone isn't masked up. Everyone's not vaccinated and they feel that they may be at risk. I see people every day that are talking about, I'm just not ready to go back in yet. I'm not ready to go. I have to wait, but then there's the variant and there's this, but our job is pushing us back. And it's like, uh -uh, stop, take, take note of what you're feeling. How's, you know, heart rate. And Dr. Jacobs will be able to talk more about that part, but blood pressure, heart rate, pulse, all those different things, they can give you an idea of where you are as far as making sure that you're in a safe and good place with yourself. Please elaborate on that, Dr. Jacobs. That's, that's vital. Yeah, it really is. And if you're anxious or you're having some anxiety, uh, a lot of times it it will raise that blood pressure. So if you're someone that suffers from high blood pressure or hypertension, you should be checking that blood pressure on a at least a, a, a week, on a weekly basis. If you're anxious and have anxiety as well, it does raise up your blood sugars as well. So if you're a diabetic or if you're a borderline diabetic, that's something you probably should be talking to your doctor about if you don't have a, a glucometer or machine to check at the house. Uh, also migraines, a lot of folks because uh, anxiety and being anxious will kick off those uh, migraines. Uh, so you have to be mindful, uh, digestive problems, you get bloating and gas, uh, swings and bouts of constipation and diarrhea, neck pain, uh, joint issues, uh, all can stem from being anxious, having some sort of anxiety. And also, as Dr. He said, you know, and if you don't sleep well at night, unfortunately, that just can just mess up your entire day. Uh, you really, we all need to get about seven, eight hours of sleep. And I know many of us function on a lot less, but we really, really do need about seven or eight hours of sleep in order to function uh, well on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Wow, you know, people need to fear the virus and not the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And I was reading that, I, I don't know who needs to hear this, uh, but polio and smallpox never reached natural herd immunity. They were eradicated by vaccines. And you know, let's even move even further, or or about 
why um, either one can answer this, Dr. Jacobs or Dr. Keith, Black Americans, African Americans are very suspicious about the medical, the medical society. And, and, and please educate people about this Tuskegee study. I think people are, are holding that, they're still holding on to that study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, well, I'll, I'll mention the Tuskegee study and then I'll let Dr. Heath take it over from there. <laughs> but uh, so, so what was it? It was uh, a, uh, they injected syphilis into a number of uh, uh, black males. And instead of giving them treatment, they watch the disease take its natural course so that they can write down and document what the signs and symptoms and what were the effects of syphilis. And so they, so they didn't treat them, they had treatment, but they didn't give them anything. They didn't give them penicillin, they didn't give them, give them any kind of medication. They just basically watched uh, these folks die. And so that's the Tuskegee uh, 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 study uh, which was absolutely horrible uh, to, to give someone a disease and then watch it just take over someone and watch them die. And so there are a number of safeguards now that have uh, been put in place down through the years where they no longer allow folks to be guinea pigs like that. And that's the mindset. A lot of folks think, well, I don't want to be a guinea pig. This is a, you know, this doesn't even have FDA approval. So why would I want to get this vaccine? But I, I tell people at this particular point, you know, look at the science behind it. And there's over 600 million folks that have gotten vaccinated now. You don't see anyone dying as a result of this. There's good studies, there's good, um, and what I like about it is that it's been replicated throughout the entire world. So not just here in the United States, but these studies uh, uh, when it comes to these vaccines have been studied all over the, the world. and. Uh, uh, has been proven to be safe for all of us. And so, uh, and the fact that it's been validated throughout the world, that's something that we should grab hold to and understand. And, and just to, I'll reiterate again, uh, on at Moderna, there is a black epidemiologist that actually worked on the, the vaccine. And she's out talking, saying that there's nowhere in the world she would have suggested a vaccine that was not safe for her parents, her grandparents, for her relatives, for herself. She worked on it and she validates that it was it's just good medicine at this particular point. And, uh, and uh, as I'm ending, there are a lot of other things that are not FDA approved, but we take every day, vitamin, herbs, and supplements. We take them every day and they have not gone through any type of FDA approval. And we can make a combination out of them that we concoct. And we're like, oh, we know what's good for our body. And we haven't even tested to see if our blood work is saying that it's okay for us. I mean, we've heard the other things that we need to take and we're, we're not even looking at the science behind what happens with vitamins. But it's also important just where you were talking about the Tuskegee experiment. If we go back a little further, and I love the article that you sent to us, Ms. Yarrow, with um, talking about how that was actually developed in um, Africa that eradicated uh, smallpox. You know, and that came from uh, what we consider a motherland. So, and they brought it over and they were able to tell people how to vaccinate folks and to get these inoculations. And that's where it all started. And then the other point is that when people are babies and unless there's a, some serious religion or um, reasons that they don't get them, Every last one of our kids have a vaccination card that they started when they were younger and they had no say. <laughs> and every one of us have taken some type of vaccinations through the years and we're still here mm -hmm. and we're still functioning and we're still doing well and it hasn't caused us harm. So that's where we have to look at. If you get your vaccination card, ask a parent, ask somebody that, you know, when you were younger, how many vaccines did I have? You're going to know that you had quite a few. First, when you were, what, three months, six months, two weeks, 
And you kept getting them all the way up until you were 12. And most of the young folks even here and now have even had the HPV, that mm -hmm. vaccination. And so that's why I'm saying that you don't have to fear the vaccine. Mm -hmm. You can just actually take it and you'll be even better off for it, you know. Yeah, people need to, we were reiterated again, people need to fear the virus and not the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Ladies, Dr. Heath, Dr. Jenkins, when will we get back to normal? I've been looking at it as a new normal mm -hmm. because sometimes we have to learn to live with things. We get aches and pains or we break a leg or, or have something happen and we learn how to live with it. And so we have to learn how to live with this virus that's out there. And part of it is one, getting vaccinated, two, wearing a mask, three, social distancing. You know, those things we know work. So if you get those things, it can really help. Um, and if you get sick, quarantine. You know, stay away from others. Don't still go out to the stores or go, oh, yeah, they'll never know. Don't do that. You're hurting others as well as yourselves too. Oh, thank yeah. you. Close us out, Dr. Jacobs. Well, I'll agree totally with Dr. Heath. It's a new normal. Uh, it, we now have telehealth, telemedicine uh, that is here to stay as a result of this pandemic. So that's something good, actually, that has come out of this. I would suggest, folks, that you fear that virus and not the vaccine is has been proven to be safe get out there encourage your children grandmothers encourage your grandchildren encourage them to go out there and get vaccinated so we can get back to our new normal <laughs> so fear the virus not the vaccine exactly this is definitely an episode that should be shared with family and friends so you know, send this out via email, everyone, Facebook, wherever you want to share it. Dr. Jacobs and Dr. Keith, thank you so much for, you know, sharing your wisdom and your knowledge to the Sister Power viewers. I'm Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, host of Sister Power and president of Citizen Empowering Hawaii. Aloha.